And you know, I have five, ten times the grant funding of the rest of the department combined. It's just, it's crazy. I will say my accomplishments have not been recognized very well here. When I go to conferences, go to other places, my colleagues all thought I was already a full professor because my research was valuable. They're always surprised why I still have not been given tenure. So being mistaken for a full professor when you haven't even been given tenure. And another way that epistemic exclusion was communicated was with a lack of basic comprehension of what the faculty member did, um, not being able to understand their scholarship, and as a result, they couldn't understand how it could be important. I've had the experience of being treated like the work I do is ancillary, of people kind of not really getting it, not being able to understand why it's important, and so just kind of being dismissive about it. So the lack of understanding is not only about the content, it's also about methodology, and it's about the extent to which they are different from what others are doing in the department. And what's also important here is this ongoing lack of curiosity from their colleagues. This idea that as academics, they would typically go to the literature, they would read up, they'd want to know, but when it came up to these topics, it wasn't worth their time. And individuals talked a lot about their community-based scholarship also not being understood. I always gather data in the field, so it adds one more step, because you have to have a relationship with the population, and then you have to have time to go out and do the data collection. And sometimes you have to just go out and familiar si familiarize yourself with the community and what you want to do. And I don't think mainstream really understands that. It's like, go out and ask questions. And I think, you can do that mainstream if it's clear cut, but with ethnic minority people, their response is, mm, I don't know about this. What are you going to do with this? You know? Well, maybe. Let us think about it. You can come back later. And, and one, they want to see if you're even going to come back. How many times will you come back? Because they've been mistreated this way, especially by research. So they're not going to be really open and trusting, even if you're a minority researcher. So this idea of what does it take to be successful as a community-based researcher doing work with ethnic minority populations was not evaluated, was not considered, and certainly was not valued. Okay, deciding what to cut because I'm in time. It was also informally communicated through messages that convey to faculty of color that they're not perceived as legitimate scholars or as having real scholarly abilities. I live under the illusion that if I were a tall white guy and I had a research success that I do, I would not be treated the way I am. It would be all over the webpage. Everybody would be so thrilled. And instead, they treat me like I snuck in the back door and I'm trying to pull a fast one on them or something. And I just don't get it. I don't get it. And I don't know how you fix it, because I, I truly don't. I've thought about this. I should have a lot of influence in this department. I do not. I simply do not. So this participant is talking about the ways in which epistemic exclusion strips them of any power and any influence, and how dealing with inequity on a constant basis takes a lot of mental energy. This participant has been thinking about it and clearly struggling with the implications of this and why it's so. And in essence, this is what we call in clinical psych gaslighting, where reality really seems obvious, but everything is making it questionable. And the environment here is proof that you're worth it and proof over and over and over. Yeah, you did that last year. Can you still do it again next year kind of mentality? In other words, you can never do enough. And there are also a variety of ways in which other faculty members just communicated a lack of respect for the faculty member. And they treated them and even treated their students in ways that communicated that lack of respect. So one person talked about their mentor, supposed mentor, she directly said stuff to me like, well, you're never going to be a superstar anyway. Yeah, that was pretty disrespectful. There is definitely a pattern of taking me for granted, pushing me around, not providing me the support, and I have a lot of evidence for that. Like, I got a grant. I was the PI on that grant. I was removed as PI without even checking with me. My effort on the grant was reduced without even checking in with me. Now that not only has career implications, but financial implications. I was in a meeting and a very prestigious male was talking about research and pointed to me and to the other person of color and was talking about the group 
and then the subgroup. And the subgroup consisted of me and the other person of color, and did this in a meeting with all of the faculty, and clearly had no idea, no awareness of how offensive what he had just done was, and how excluding it was. This is also someone who had been the chair of my review committee a few times, and that made it very difficult to be here and to imagine that these people could fairly evaluate me for tenure. So these interactions seek to, at least they appear in my opinion, to try and put people in the margins back in their place, even further on the margins. The lack of respect communicates that they're not welcome, and it absolutely communicates that they don't belong. And it illustrates how this may be, how this could also contribute to this leaky pipeline, to losing students along the way, because as they advance through their education and their professional lives, why would they knowingly enter into hostile environments such as these? Now, although I don't have time to talk about the outcomes of epistemic exclusion in detail, our interviews do suggest that epistemic exclusion has psychological outcomes such as distress, anger, lowered self-esteem and sense of self. Also, it has negative consequences for work outcomes like decreased productivity, barriers to advancement, and thoughts of or even efforts to leave the institution. But we also have to recognize that organizationally, there are significant costs for epistemic exclusion. Not only do these institutions find that their reputations are tarnished, which makes it difficult for them to retain the faculty of color that they have, but makes it almost impossible to recruit new faculty of color, graduate students of color, and even undergraduates of color. And there are extremely high financial costs associated with having to replace that one single faculty member. It's been estimated that it's up to 18 months of a faculty member's salary to replace them. So we have to do a much better job of making sure that all members of our academic community feel that they belong. So what we know, we know that faculty are ex experiencing epistemic exclusion, and that this happens through a variety of formal mechanisms as well as informal me mechanisms. And we know that the consequences of epistemic exclusion are grave. They're grave for the individual and for the institution, and I would argue that they're grave for the scholarship and the, the world of knowledge more, more broadly. See, as we lose scholars and we relegate entire bodies of knowledge to the margins, that can potentially be lost forever. So I'll quickly thank, stop showing me the, quickly thank my collaborators, um, the MSU Office for Inclusion and Intercultural Initiatives that funded this incredibly comprehensive study, our project staff, and as, as of course our faculty participants, and um,